welcome to Question Time on tonight's panel. Michael Forsyth, Conservative peer, financier, former MP and Secretary of State for Scotland under John Major until he lost his seat in 1997. Jean Freeman, elected to Holyrood in 2016 following a career working in criminal justice, now the Scottish Government's Health Secretary. Labour's Shadow Secretary of State for Scotland and the last remaining Labour MP in Scotland, Ian Murray. Joining us down the line from Glasgow, journalist, broadcaster and author Angela Haggerty and founder of the energy company in the UK, OVO, now the third largest energy supplier in the UK, former owner of a Formula One racing team, currently working on flying taxis, Stephen Fitzpatrick. Good evening, welcome to my guest here in the studio. Angela, welcome to you, you're joining us down the line, very good to see you, and of course, welcome to our audience joining us virtually, as is the way these days. You're joining us from the northeast of Scotland. Very good to see you, giving us a wave. And of course, welcome to you watching at home. And do join in the conversation the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time. Let's hear what you've got to say. Right, we'll get underway with our first question, which is from Catherine Kinnear. Hi, why has it taken until 15th of February for the government to impose quarantine at the border? Why haven't lessons been learned from Australia who've closed their borders in the first wave and have now got low levels of infection? Ian, why don't you kick us off? Well, it's a great question. It's a question we've been asking in both parliaments for the last year, in fact, in terms of closing the borders down. We're an island nation and most other island nations across the world have done much better than us because they did take that decision very early to stop incoming uh, traffic. We've had also the South Africa strain now for 50 odd days. And it's only now that we're taking the decision to close down our borders. It's too late. Um, there was a study, I think, by the Aberdeen University that showed that most of the deaths across the UK have happened because of the inward variants coming in uh, to Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. And it just seems, again, where both governments have been too slow to react. And the consequence of that is that we're behind the curve. It's still not coming in until the 15th, which means tens of thousands of people will be landing across the weekend on Monday into the UK, potentially with new variants of COVID. So it's too late. We welcome it. We wish it was every country, it is every country in Scotland. Uh, there are big issues around what needs to be done in terms of how people can access hotels, how they can pay for them. And I've got two constituency cases just today. Someone who's gone to give palliative care to their mother in the Czech Republic. She doesn't know how she's going to get back and pay for it. And someone whose visa's run out in the Caribbean has think, to come back. The, do you think the government should pay for it? The taxpayer should pay for it? Well, I think there has to be some kind of recompense for people who can't afford to do this. It's £1,750. And also, I think on top of all this, there's got to be some way of looking at the system that we had before when we come out of this and saying, why were we asking people to self-isolate and then not checking they were self-isolating when they were travelling? So it's been a mess. There's a resolution here, but it's too slow, it's too late, and we're already suffering the consequences of that. Michael. Well, um, the first thing is that we didn't have the vaccine, uh, and we didn't have the new variant, uh, which the scientific advice is that we should be very concerned about. So that's why the borders are being closed. But we are in the ridiculous situation where, in England, the borders are closed to people coming from red countries, uh, whereas in Scotland it's coming from all countries. And I saw Which that do you think it should be? I don't think it should be either, actually. Um, it seems to me that uh, we should concentrate on getting the vac vaccine uh, done as quickly as possible. But we and should I let anyone come in who wants to come in? Well, if you think about the position in Scotland, uh, where no one from, uh, is allowed from any country whatsoever, and where the transport minister was suggesting that we should continue with this until the rest of the world is vaccinated, by that time, we will have trashed our economy, we will have destroyed our tourism industries, and ministers have to, to balance the economic interests of the country along with the health interests and to look at the risk. And that's a difficult decision. And quite honestly, I think politicians from all parties should support the government in what it's trying to do. We've got a few hands up. Uh, Lindsay. How can we stop someone landing in at Heathrow Airport and then getting uh, onto uh, renting a car and driving up to Scotland? John? Yes. I mean, if we don't sort our health crisis, we're not going to be able to sort our economic crisis. Simple as that. Jim. This horse bolted a year ago, Cheltenham. The Isle of Man locked down about the 25th of March. They've just finished the first 25-year lockdown. They now have no social distancing. The kids are back at school. Businesses are working. Pubs are open. <clears throat> it's just far too late and just, just completely wrong. So do you think we should close the borders to, to all countries? 
it, I don't understand how 600,000 people per month can be coming into this country on essential business. I don't know what's going on. Maybe we've got the world's best eye test over it. Yeah, I, I, it's not that high, high at the moment, but I, it was that previously. Uh, Jean. So, so I think your audience has made some really good points and it is a really good question. And I, I'm sorry, but Michael, I think you're completely wrong. You know, all the public health advice here in Scotland in the summer, we brought cases down to uh, virtually zero. And the only reason they increased primarily was international travel. So we permitted the virus to re-enter the country. Now, people across the country here and across the UK are working really, really hard, uh, putting up with restrictions on their everyday life, uh, staying at home, that's a big message, not seeing friends and family, wearing face coverings, all of that. And they're doing that because they want to reduce the level of the virus uh, in their communities, in their country. I think it's government's obligation to then make sure that we take the steps to ensure that we don't bring the virus into the country. And I think the UK so, government has, has done something, but not enough. It should be uh, entirely all countries. We should say to people, I'm sorry, if, you, if you're travelling in, as we are saying in Scotland, if you're travelling into Scotland, then you need to quarantine in these hotels, this managed quarantine for 10 days, Tested before and you how travel, are you going to we enforce know. that? How are you going to enforce that? How are you going to enforce it when people can fly into England and come well, up to Scotland? Well, exactly. Are you exactly going to have border guards? And the point actually goes back to you, Michael, and your party. Because well, no, it could come UK, back to you, Jean, well, as well. No. Because, I mean, you, as Wales, for example, has, has fined people who've gone from England to Wales. Well, are you going to be doing that? To answer Lindsay's question, what about people yeah. who, who arrive so, in England and drive up and want to go back into okay. Scotland? OK, so there's two things that uh, we will do. We'll keep on the discussions across the four nations with the UK government to try and persuade them. I had one tonight just before uh, I came here to try and persuade them to not stick to just the red zones. But in the meantime, we also have to look at what we do about the land border precisely because of what the lady in the audience said. People, most international travel into Scotland is rooted through the big hubs around London, Manchester, and elsewhere. So have what you got we a can't have is people coming in, getting on public transport and coming up to Scotland, and we don't know about that, and they're not required to quarantine in a way that we can manage. So we have to consider what our options are about that land border. But now, I'd rather that wasn't the case, to be honest. I'd rather, across the four nations, we were taking well, the right why approach. Why you, would, but if we're not, that's okay. what we have to yeah. do. But, Jean, you haven't given an explanation of why it's taken to mid-February to make these decisions. Both governments have been too slow on this. If what you've said at the start of your answer is true, and I have no reason to believe it's not true, that we imported the new variants and that we've got our Fine race not. against time vaccine versus variant here, why has it taken the Scottish government, as well as the UK government, till the 15th of February when this comes in to do anything about it? Well, well, you know, Ian, that, that not all the powers are devolved to Scotland. But you've got and the power because so, you're making the decision now. And so what we have been trying to do is reach an overall agreement across the four nations because okay. we have taken the approach, as others have from the outset, that where we can get four nation agreement, that's the best way to do it. I don't accept where the more are, argument where because we you're are making now, the decision today. Where we are now is that we, we can't wait any longer for this and we've learned those lessons from the summer and we're saying now that we need to uh, prevent international travel from any okay. country into Scotland. And that means we do have to look at what our options are on the land border because the UK government won't go far it's enough. A, but it's a decision that you've made. It's a decision that where the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish government has the power to make it. OK, I'm going to get Angela. Let's bring you in. Well, I do think that both governments have been far too slow to act on the border issue. If you've been listening to the experts, the scientists, they've been saying since the beginning of the pandemic that there are some clear strategies that you can follow to try and limit the, the impact that it has. And on a number of occasions, the UK has not followed that advice, the border being one example. 
Um, and we're now in a situation where we have vaccines and this is it's unprecedented really when you think back to the start of the pandemic we were being told it would be you know a minimum of 18 months but probably longer than that be realistically before we were looking at vaccines and yet here we are less than a year and we're already well into the vaccine rollout program so that's incredible but what's vital now is that we try and prevent variants because that's the big threat to the vaccine strategy and and the quickest way to get the economy back on track, to do all of these things, is to get in control of the virus. So we're only talking about, hopefully, a, another matter of months before we should have our population as, as best vaccinated as we possibly can. And I think that we should be, it's too little too late, I would still argue, but we should absolutely be locking down as much as we have to, focusing on the vaccine rollout, and, um, and then we we can think about moving forward after that. My worry about this, though, is I, I, I tend to agree with the Scottish government's position that we, we should just you know stop travel from everywhere rather than just from red zones. Um, but my fear about this is that it falls into this polit politicisation that we've seen a few times. So it all becomes about borders and then it becomes about politics and about the constitution and it doesn't become about public health. That should be at the forefront of everybody's minds. Um, and I would really urge politicians to make sure that they don't fall down that hole because that's really not what the public is looking for. Stephen? So I have... And I listen to the audience and I speak to my friends and I, I ask people about this topic. The thing that I get more than anything else is the sense of fear that the public has now. And I look back to where we were in March last year and what we were asked to do. And the plan was to flatten the curve, to protect the NHS, to build capacity. And slowly but surely, we have shifted these goalposts to what's expected. And I have to say, I understand why so many people have this sense of fear because of what they hear from the media, from politicians and so on. And I also understand why people feel so strongly about the border issue, because I cannot understand for the life of me why 12 months ago, 11 months ago, this wasn't a policy that we instituted straight away. So when I hear people talk about this policy today, what I hear really being expressed is that they don't understand why we didn't do this a year ago. Mm -hmm. But our politicians are not paid to peddle paranoia or feed on our fears. They're paid to lead. And when I look at all of the news today, I see signs of hope everywhere. We have better therapeutics, we have falling cases, we have a better understanding of infection rates. We have 90% of the most vulnerable people in the country that are vaccinated. And I ask, what are people afraid of? It's not, not right. quite that yet, but... It, I mean, 90% uh, of the over 70s have been, have been vaccinated. And 13 and a half million people in total today, 50% of the panellists in this room have been vaccinated. And so when I think about what it is that politicians are trying to encourage, I say, we weren't ready for COVID-19, we weren't ready for lockdown, but we have to be ready for life after lockdown. And when I hear politicians talking about banning all inter uh, inbound travel... Well, quarantine... is that, well, that's the question. Is that what you think should, should happen now? So you, I understand... you, don't, you think it should have happened earlier, but do you yes, think it should happen I now? I understand if a government says to me, or a pol political leader says to me, we've taken a risk-based approach, these are 33 risky countries, and we think that this risk is worth protecting against. For a political leader to say, I think it's a popular decision to ban all travel... I mean, the variant is present in 35 other countries that are not on the list. But uh, again, I would say, the, which variant? And are we going to protect South against Africa all the future Brazil. variants that we don't currently know about? And when we don't know, maybe they will, maybe they won't be affected by the vaccine. That will be this year, will be next year's vaccine. The point is, I honestly believe we have to start to balance the interests of public health with private freedoms and the, all of the other aspects of our lives. And I can tell you, there are many other threats to our livelihoods and to our lives than COVID-19. And I see only a one-dimensional approach to this decision. Eileen. So we're an island nation. We had the opportunity to learn. We were slightly ahead of the curve. We could have learned from New Zealand and Australia. They managed to close their inter-country borders in between states. We've done nothing about it, and we've had the worst death rate in Europe. It's an absolute scandal. This should have been done at the outset, close the border, stop the virus coming in and contain it. Instead, we've had almost a year's worth now of open, close, start, stop, lockdown and various restrictions. It's too slow, it's too little and it's too late. 
And it's still a botch job, because now are we going to create a border between Scotland and England, never mind with Ireland? The assumption here is that uh, by having a lockdown, so suddenly the virus will go away. Uh, if we'd done that um, last year, uh, the moment you release the lockdown, it gets back into the community. What has changed is that we have a vaccine, and if you have the population vaccinated, uh, then the, 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 having a no, lockdown, you can then change. get out of the lockdown, no. and, and, and you can save the jobs and the costs, which are enormous. I mean, our economy is hemorrhaging. Every day our debts are going up, and so we need to balance the, the health needs against the economic needs of the country. That's the wrong balance. That is, that is the wrong balance. You know, the, one of the audience said, quite rightly, unless you get the health needs sorted, the economy will go down the tank anyway because people will get seriously ill, they will die, and our NHS will be overwhelmed. People understand that. That's why they're doing all the things they're doing. Well, and on the vaccine, Michael, the vaccine isn't a, a magic bullet. The vaccine is one of the really important layers of protection. But right now, we do not know for sure how effective it is on transmission. We know that it protects you from serious illness and death. Not completely, but very well indeed. But we don't know that it stops you transmitting well, the virus from one person to another. So this conversation between two governments shows you why was this not done a year ago? Okay, because no, for all the things that, that have been said, I, I it you, should have been done earlier. You've made that point. Let's just hear a bit more from the audience. Uh, Catherine, you asked this question. Yes, thanks. I do understand that the balancing act is a very delicate balancing act between the economy um, and health, but but. We've known for a long time that the virus has spread very quickly with the movement of people and between people. So it's almost like um, the government's played Russian roulette with people's health because we've not, um, I mean, I've been really right, you know, we've not, we're too slow, we've, we're too slow to react. And I think that will damage the economy more than, than anything else. OK, I'm going to, we could talk about this all evening, I think, but I'm going to move on, take another question from Ian, Ian Dane. If the SNP get a majority in May, what right do the Tories have to deny Scottish democracy with holding a referendum on independence? Angela. If uh, the SNP get a majority in May, then the, the Tories don't have any authority to deny a second independence referendum. But I have to point out that we've already been in this situation. The SNP has won so many elections since 2014 um, and somewhere in its ma manifesto has always had the reference to the second independence referendum. So we're already in a state where we have the, the, the Conservative government and potentially <coughs> even if it was a Labour government <coughs> saying that uh, they're going to block a second referendum effectively because now is not the time, which, um, I mean, you'll have to excuse me, but I don't think that a phrase is, is simple, simplistic as now is not the time, should overtake parliamentary democracy. And now, does the fact the that we're in the middle of a pandemic make any difference to that, do you think? Well, if the SNP won a majority, then they, are, they are, have then won another parliamentary term for what, four or five years. We are hoping that by the towards the end of this year that we might be coming out of this real crisis stage with the pandemic. So nobody's saying that if the SNP won the election in May, they're going to hold a referendum the week after. But the, but the fundamentally, we have to get back to the point here. This is not about timing. We can have debates about timing and when the best time to do it would be. The point here is about who has the right who has the authority now if the scottish people go to the polls and they vote for something quite clearly in an election and then that is that is um that is denied by westminster then they're effectively saying that the scottish parliament doesn't have really any authority and we're then beyond democracy and this is the part that worries me because if we exhaust the, the democratic roots and westminster keeps saying no the big question then is what happens next? Because you're not people in Scotland are not simply just going to sit and say, oh, well, we voted for it, but they've said no, so let's just move on. Of course they're not. They're going to get angry about the fact that they're being denied the thing that they voted for. So um, I think that we would be getting into very, very dangerous territory if Westminster continues to try and block this. It looks as though the SNP is going to win a majority in May. We know that the... The polls in favour of independence are now rising consistently. Westminster okay. can't keep ignoring this. It has to be addressed. Sharon. Hi there. Um, so Scottish trade to the UK 
um, accounts for 60% of exports, compared with 19% um, to the UK. How to the EU? I think you might. I don't believe I don't believe it's responsible for Scotland to try to be leaving the UK right now and attempting to rejoin the EU. Um, where it can't be considered economically justifiable, and let alone um, before pre um, pre COVID. And the situation's even worse now. Jason? I'd just like to point out to people and just try and remind them that uh, the SNP is not the only pro independence party in Scotland, and there is the Green Party. And then, therefore, the SNP could quite conceivably not actually gain a majority, but there could be a majority vote for pro independence parties um, overall if you take into account the Green vote. John? Ah, yes. I mean, after Brexit, which divided us, and now with this pandemic, do we really want independence to re -sow division and cripple our economy even further? I mean, it was a once in a generation, that's once in a lifetime we were told, and we voted. Michael? Well, actually, uh, I took the view that uh, if the SNP had uh, been able to get the support of the Scottish electorate, then there should be a referendum. Uh, and I said that many years ago. Uh, and we had a referendum, and it was a once-in-a-generation referendum. And the odd thing about those people who sort of say that they believe in democracy is that they don't accept the results of referenda. They don't accept the Brexit result. They don't accept the last Scottish referendum result. Um, and the Scottish Parliament, the elections to the Scottish Parliament, the duties uh, of the Scottish Parliament are about health and education and, the thing, and employment and the things that are, really matter to people. They're not about constitutional matters. They, they're reserved to the United Kingdom Parliament. And the reason that the SNP are campaigning on this constitutional issue is because they're not interested in devolution. They're interested in the destruction of the United Kingdom. And they certainly don't want the election to be about their record on health or education or any of these other areas because it's abysmal. I mean, when I left office in 1997, Scottish education was way ahead of England. Now it's way behind. And if you look at the record on health and elsewhere, I mean, I just find it extraordinary in the middle of a pandemic, when we've got all the, the consequences in terms of lost jobs and the rest, that people should be thinking that we should divide our country instead of actually putting together uh, the damage which has been done by this virus, getting our economy growing again in order to pay down the debt and to create jobs. I just find it un utterly unbelievable. And Scotland, uh, Scotland is not the Scottish Nationalist Party. Scot and the Scottish Nationalist Party shouldn't take the electorate for granted and insist that they're going to get a majority. So the voters Michael. should give them a message which is to concentrate on health and education and the things that matter to people. But we are not insisting or, or taking for granted that we would get, <coughs> excuse me, a majority at all. Well, why and it's curious, it's curious, Michael, that the, actually the people in Scotland who are talking, the political parties who are talking most about independence are your own and Labour. What we are talking about is a pandemic and how you well, rebuild Scotland. And our view, well, our view is well, that if, like there is, if there is a majority in the next parliamentary election on the 6th of May for independence, that 20, 21 polls in a row uh, voted people saying that they want to be independent. But the Scottish people, the basic fact here is the people in Scotland have the right to choose whether or not they want to have a referendum. And they if did. they choose that, they if did. they choose that, they... well, you only get a choice once. People well, that's in what Scotland, you said. That's no, what your party no, said. No. Once in a generation, you said. No, we didn't, actually. But remember, one really important thing has changed since then. We were told in 2014 oh. that if we voted to stay in the Union, that fun. meant that we would be in the European Union. And if we voted to leave the UK Union, we'd be out of Europe. Look what's happened. 62% of people in Scotland voted against Brexit and now we're out of Europe with huge bureaucracy, real damage to the economy in Scotland and I hope we come on to that. So what we are saying is that people in Scotland have the right to choose. That they have the right to choose. We'll have the argument about whether or not we are independent if people choose that they want a referendum. It's really straightforward and it's a basic democratic question and no one, actually no one, should deny the democratic right of people in Scotland to choose if they want to have a referendum to be an independent country or not. Gary. <clears throat> yes, I think the point that Jean Freeman makes is uh, quite a good point. I think the people of Scotland 
have spoken on a number of occasions with, with regards to how they want to be managed in the UK environment. I don't think Boris Johnson has a mandate to say to the Scottish people it was a once-in-a-lifetime referendum. And you only have to look at the way that Boris Johnson treats the SNP group down at Westminster in debate. If anyone's watched debate, he treats them with scorn and total disregard. And I think it's unacceptable. The Scottish people wanted to remain in the EU. That's been disrespected. It's now clear that there's a mandate from the Scottish people. And if there's a clear mandate in May with an overwhelming majority... SNP government, I think Boris Johnson has no choice but to give the Scottish people their wish and grant them another referendum. Alex? I think the handling of the pandemic has shown that there will be divides after it's over. We don't have the flexibility up here to do a lot other than what we're given from Westminster and really, we really need to take sort of control of our own destiny in some ways and look after our own affairs and not be come down to Westminster about all these topics. We need to get on and have a debate about it again. Let's have another referendum. Simon? I'm an SNP supporter and I voted for independence and I think if Boris doesn't want uh, the Scottish people to keep asking for independence, a good start would be to get the SNP's name right. That would be a good start, I think. Well, as opposed to calling it the Scottish, which you did as well, Michael, the Scottish Nationalist Party. Yeah, it's the Scottish, and you know it's the Scottish National, National Party. Party. Well, but you're making a point so with that. What, yeah, what you see is what you get, yeah. yeah the Scottish National Party. Is it Stephen, as a business person, give us your perspective. Oh, um, well, first can I say, I used to live in Edinburgh, about a mile away from here, and I spent some of the happiest days of my life right here. And it would make me incredibly sad to think of Scotland as an independent country. But I understand, as an entrepreneur and somebody who didn't want to report to somebody else, who didn't want to uh, work for somebody else, I understand the urge to find independence. And, and actually, when I think of Scotland, I think of a, a, the potential of an independent Scottish nation. I have no doubt whatsoever that Scotland could be a, a thriving, independent economy with a proud history and an exciting future. But I have to say, you ask any entrepreneur what happens when you quit your job and you set off on your own. And anybody who tells you that it's going to be easier or better, you're going to be better off, that you're going to have even more independence, I can tell you it's not true. Mm. As an entrepreneur, you sacrifice so much, you work twice as hard, they get half as much, you risk losing everything, and it takes a long time for that to pay off. And I, and I say, Honestly, if this is a, the path that Scotland wants to go down, and uh, I can understand both sides of the argument, but if anybody tells you that it's going to be easy or better or you're going to have more independence, I can tell you there's a whole bunch of other problems that come. It's an and interesting view given that you supported Brexit. I mean, would you not have applied the same argument to the UK as a whole, leaving the EU? Presumably not. One of the reasons I supported Brexit was that I became very interested in homelessness in particular. And I saw a real challenge with homelessness in particular, but social equality in general, as being part of a group of nations with open borders, 28 nations with open borders, some of whom, some of which have an income of 80% lower <coughs> than the UK. And so if we really are serious about social equality, it's very difficult to do that when you say we will provide, and we should, by the way, provide every homeless person with somewhere to sleep, but then find that that applies to potentially 500 million people. And so that was some very specific reasons why right. I voted for Brexit. I actually thought economically we'd be worse off, but socially perhaps more cohesive. And I think the opposite is true with, with potentially Scottish independence, certainly over the shorter term. And I genuinely, hand on heart, say I, I, if Scotland decides they want to go for independence, I will be sad, but I will be actually supportive and optimistic and so on. But this is a decision that will affect this generation and future generation and children and people not even born for decades or hundreds of years, and I would say, what is the rush? Right now, every nation around the world is trying to figure out how on earth they are going to recover from this economic and social disaster. And with 250,000 children in Scotland living in poverty, I cannot understand for the life of me why this is the time. But that said, <laughs> if this is the time, then, then I think it is for the Scottish people to decide. Alistair? I think uh, one of the things that's 
fueling the desire for Scotland to become independent, despite the fact that there may be concerns or problems about what that might entail, is how badly the UK government is handling just about everything. Uh, and that's been mentioned already, that um, some of the comments and things in Westminster are uh, absolutely unhelpful. So, Can I just... And Kelly, can, just, let me just say one more thing and then I'll come back to you, Mike, and I'll need to get Ian in. Uh, Kelly. So, we're getting a second chance. If we get the referendum, we're getting a second chance to vote for independence. But what if, as Stephen said, it's a lot harder than it turns out? Will we... Uh, how easy would it be to rejoin the UK? Is that something that anyone's considering? Are we going to get a chance to go back? Or to have some buyer's remorse, if you like. Uh, Ian? Well, I think the reason that the SNP want to turn the elections in May into a referendum on whether or not we have a referendum is because they can't defend their own record in government. 14 That's years they've been in That's government. There is 250,000 children in poverty. There's not one extra power the Scottish Parliament requires to deal with 250,000 kids in poverty. There's not one extra power required to narrow the attainment gap that is growing all the time in our no. once proud education system. No. We haven't met the uh, waiting times targets for the NHS since 2012, since the law was passed by the Scottish Parliament to put them into law. This was all before the pandemic. And if we want to turn it into a referendum to have a referendum, it really is a slap in the face to every single person in this country who's worried about their jobs, worried about their livelihoods and worried about the health of their relatives and their friends. Because it's preposterous. And the Mike Russell, who's the Constitutional Secretary, the First Minister, and Ian Blackford in Westminster have all talked about a referendum this year. That's extraordinary. So maybe if we're going to turn the May's election to, into a referendum on whether or not we have a referendum, we could start asking the big questions to be debated now. The currency issue. Why, how we get back into the EU, because uh, Jean's already said uh, very clearly that she thinks that Brexit is a material change of circumstances, even though it was highlighted in the White Paper and David Cameron had highlighted it before the last referendum. The next material change of circumstances is Covid recovery. We've got to put every single focus into Covid recovery and we're going to honestly set, have a referendum this year, set up a new nation in 18 months, is what was the proposal before, with no access to the EU, with the EU border being created at Berwick with our greatest trading partner, no questions or answers about currency. We, it's seven years since the last referendum, we still don't have these uh, questions in front of us. The oil price was supposed to be 114 dollars a barrel, it's been less than half of that for the last six years and the entire economy was based on that. The economic proposition's a disaster. The social prop proposition's a disaster. No, the border at Berwick's a disaster. And if Brexit's told us anything, we should be building bridges and not building walls. And I would say this, I'm the only person on this panel that's consistent here, because I believe Scotland should be in the UK and the UK should be in the EU. That's the way that you make your economy strong and that's the way you bring people together. Angela. Listen, there, there... We have a saying, you know, with crisis comes opportunity. And what I think that some politicians like Ian are just not getting... You, you want to talk about the SNP's domestic record. And, and it's as if, you know, it's, it, it's like the world is in flames and you want to talk about a tiny little part of it rather than see the bigger picture. Now, you have to recognise what has happened since 2014. We've, we have now had Brexit um, and... Scotland still does not want Brexit, and that vote, does, you know, we feel in Scotland as though that we talk about democracy and recognising the results of referendums. We certainly feel like that one hasn't been recognised in Scotland. But also, we now have COVID, and this is a crisis that none of us saw coming. And sometimes, when you're in the middle of a situation like that, especially when you're when the population seems to be have high approval of how Nicola Sturgeon is dealing with this as opposed to Boris Johnson, what you then have is a population that could be looking at this and thinking, well, things probably can't get an awful lot worse than they are right now. So maybe this is just exactly the time to do it. Maybe this is the time for independence. We're in a crisis anyway. So let's just take control of it for ourselves and then we can do we can build back up for ourselves. And I think politicians are not quite getting this bigger picture and they're arguing about the smaller detail of it. 
you have to look at the polls, Ian and, and Michael. If you're unionist, you should be looking at the polls and realising that support for independence is going up. And if you want to stop that, you need to come up with a good proposition for the union that isn't just about how terrible Scotland would do if it went out there as an independent country on well, its own. Can... Because there's no reason why Scotland couldn't survive and thrive as an independent well, I country. Can give you, I can... And you can't keep oh, well. going back to these same arguments. You have to give people something more. I can give you 20 billion reasons why we are lucky to be part of a United Kingdom. £20 billion is how much has come north the border to deal with Covid. The, the fact it's that we have... free money, Michael. This is money that the Scottish taxpayer contributes you, to the Treasury. You know perfectly well that the, the balance, your own figures, your own jazz figures shows that Scotland gets a huge amount from the United Kingdom Treasury. And this particular crisis, the furlough scheme, the, the vaccines, where would we have been if we had voted as you wanted in 2014? We would have been where the we UK been, is, we borrowing would, money no, to no, help you, us get through this. You, the UK is getting through this, this by borrowing can, money. Can, okay. can I finish my point? Where would we have been if we had voted to leave the United Kingdom in 2014 with this crisis? Europe. How would we have managed? How would we have... Uh, we wouldn't have had the strength of the United Kingdom around us. We wouldn't have had the support that we've had for the furlough scheme. We wouldn't That's have had the ability of a Bank of England to be able to finance it. If you want to have another referendum, you at the very least should spell out how we'd survive, how we'd survive with our currency. What would happen to people's pensions? How would we pay their pensions? How would you pay your share of the debt, which is now enormous? There's going to be half a trillion pounds of debt increased this year. And it's just fantasy politics and fantasy economics to think that you are going to risk the future of Scotland by, by shearing yourself away from the strength of the United Kingdom around you. So what I don't really understand is why, in the face of tw the 21 polls that show that a majority, a increasing majority of people in Scotland want not only a referendum but to be independent, an SMP... Well, that's because you keep SMP telling them lies about that, the consequences. No, no, okay, oh, okay. come but, along. But just in terms people of just answering in, his point... People in Scotland right, are, are not daft. They know when they're being told lies. And really, it is a bit disrespectful to suggest such a thing. What we've said, and it isn't actually an election on a referendum, Scot the Scottish National Party and other parties will take a prospectus to the electorate that will be more than about a referendum on independence. But the, the basic fact is the people of Scotland should have the democratic right to choose whether or not they want a referendum. The people of Scotland... If they do, if they do then we'll have all these the arguments people of Scotland, on both sides. The people but of Scotland right have now, the democratic right are to be told to deny the consequences. That. You're the democratic to right to be told that. the consequences. Jean, if you just tell me tonight what the currency would be and when, I'm happy to take that away and, and, and look at it. If you tell me what the accession to the EU would be when you're, you're doing what the Brexiteers did, you want to cherry-pick the EU. No currency, no, no Schengen. Don't want you don't even want the, the very EU. deal that's just been signed between the UK and the EU, which would be the border at Berwick. No, be I certainly don't because of be the damage it's doing to our economy. To it would have to be. No, the deal between the EU and the UK no. would determine what the border would be between Scotland and no, England. Because, because Scotland, we would under your proposal, would be an EU country and England would not be. And therefore, the border between Scotland and England would be determined by the very trade agreement that's just been signed, the very thin and dreadful trade agreement that's just mm. been signed by Boris Johnson no, no. on the 31st of December. That's be straight with people. That, just be straight I'm with very people. happy to be straight with people, Ian, okay. if you will, I'm, and that's just not I'm true just, what you're saying. I'm going to stop. It's not because it's not interesting and not because we couldn't talk about it all night, but there are other things and there's other people just than you two in the room. Marvellous though it is to hear what you've got to say. Let's take another question from Fiona Dickens. <laughs> Salmon and Nicola Sturgeon suggest that the SNP is a party divided splintered and in crisis. For reasons I don't quite understand, we couldn't quite hear the beginning of your, your question, but it's, does the public fallout between Alex Hammond and Nicola Sturgeon suggest the SNP is a party divided, splintered and in crisis? Jean? No, I don't think the party I'm in is divided, splintered or in crisis. You don't think it's divided it's, with what's going it, on? It, it has. It's, it's a big party. It's a broad church, very reflective of Would you describe Scotland it as itself. united? Um, and it has disagreements. All parties have disagreements. Michael belongs to a party that has disagreements, uh, one currently about their Scottish leader. Ian himself has had disagreements with his own party. That's not That's uncommon. Yeah, but the question it's is about uncommon. the SNP, Jean. Well, my point is it's not uncommon for there to be disagreements amongst party members. 
Um, and, uh, and I think that that is uh, entirely to be expected. What isn't acceptable, and I think it is important that I say this, is that any disagreements are conducted in a way that is disrespectful of other points of view. I, I want to be in a political party and in a country where different viewpoints and different arguments, where a disputatious race, as Donald Dewar famously said, are conducted with respect and without abuse. That is the key point. And who but, do you think is being disrespectful then? Well, people, people feel that they have been, when they've been voicing opinions on different matters, that they have been not listened to and that they have been treated disrespectfully on all sides of all the different uh, arguments and disputes that are going on. But the party itself and all those people who support it and all those activists are getting on with the job that they want to do, which is to promote uh, what the SNP is doing, <coughs> to promote the case for independence. And on the question of uh, Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon, I've worked with Nicola Sturgeon for five years. I know her to be a woman of considerable talent and integrity, and I'm very proud to be one of her cabinet secretaries. She's completely focused on what she believes is the right thing to do for the people of Scotland right now in the pandemic and in building back after the pandemic. Ian. Well, the party's tearing itself apart no, because it's you're either not. in the Salmon corner or you're in the Sturgeon corner. I mean, you've got claim and counterclaim. You've got people in court. You've got issues around sexual harassment. You've got a committee in Parliament unable to get to the truth because of obfuscation and deliberate denials from all the parties Not true. Uh, involved. Not true. And you've got a situation whereby the First Minister of Scotland, who has all the talents that Jean has eloquently said, and I agree, she's a very consummate politician, has a tremendous amount of talents, can't remember meetings that she's had when people have told her about sexual harassment. This, this is had not a meeting true. with the, the current First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, had a meeting with the former First Minister in the house of the Chief Executive of the SNP, which who just happens to be married to the current First Minister, and nobody talked about, nobody mentioned what they were talking about. This is a cesspit that has to be resolved for two reasons. One, it's bringing our democratic structures in Scotland into disrepute, including having scrutiny of government. And secondly, there is women involved here who were brave to come forward yes, with indeed. sexual harassment and it's all being swept under the carpet. It's a disgraceful thing that's happened and it's a disgraceful thing that's what's happened to Joanna Cherry, who's one of the most able MPs in Parliament. She's done her home affairs brief uh, wonderfully. I worked very closely with her uh, during all the Brexit issues with the prorogation court cases and things. Cast aside in the SNP for having a different view. Um, that's the kind of party that we've got running Scotland at the moment, and I think it's undermining our democracy. And until we get to the truth, we will never know what the problem has been. And okay. Nicola Sturgeon still refuses to answer the question. If no, she, she will resign, Nicola Sturgeon, if she's broken no. the ministerial code. Okay, no. Let me just restate, obviously, Alex Salmon was acquitted and Nicola Sturgeon denies misleading. Of course. Uh, and let's be but clear uh, on two really important briefly, matters. Briefly, Jane. There is an independent review of whether or not the First Minister broke the code of conduct. She says no, and I believe her. Secondly, but there is an independent review that will go through due process. Secondly, the First Minister has said from the outset that she will appear in front of that committee under oath and answer any and okay. all questions that it has. So the idea that she is trying to hide away in some way couldn't be further from the Stephen. truth. And you know it. Stephen. I am delighted to say I don't have very much to say about this. It, <laughs> there's a lot of he, shared, he said and she said and they said, and I am delighted not to have to be too much party to this discussion. I have to say, when I, uh, when I travel back home to Belfast, there's a lot of local politics. When I travel to Scotland, the same. When I go to travel abroad, or you know, we, we have business all over the world, and Scottish people are united when they travel. British people are united when they travel. And, and yet, you know, always when, we, when we're at home, these things appear very big. So I'm delighted not to have much to say about <laughs> OK, it. you stay out of it then. OK, Secret Fiona M. I would just like to know why the inquiry is taking so long. There's clearly more to this argument on both sides. OK, it, it, there, there is a date it has to report by. Uh, Jason. I think Ian maybe briefly touched on this already, but... Do the concerns sort of raised around the treatment of transsexuals in the party also kind of speak to splintering as well? Well, the, the question is, does the public fallout between Alex Hamlin and Nicholas Surgeon suggest the SNP is divided, splintered in crisis? Uh, Michael? Well, clearly there is a civil war going on inside the SNP. You've only got to look at the Twitter feeds to see that. 
Uh, and uh, I'm much less concerned about that than what is happening to the standards of government in Scotland. Uh, when you have uh, civil servants coming to give evidence under oath and then having to come back to correct their testimony, and when you're told that £75,000 of our money was spent on coaching them before they went to give evidence, something has gone very, very wrong with the government of Scotland. When the Scottish Parliament votes on two occasions for information to be provided to the inquiry, and the First Minister ignores it, something has gone very badly wrong. And when Alex Salmond is expected to appear before the committee, I, I have no view on uh, whether he's right or wrong. He was acquitted by the courts. Half a million pounds of our money was, was spent uh, in uh, a, a process which the courts found to be improper. Uh, and when, when he's asked to go to the inquiry, and the evidence which he's presented is not made available to the public, it does begin to look as if there has been some dirty work at the crossroads. And that is very damaging for the conduct of government and for Scotland's standing in the world. And I hope at the election that the SNP will be given their jotters because the, the, this, 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 this is at the absolute heart of the integrity of government. Angela. Um, I think that uh, we have to question how much of this actually cuts through to the public. Um, I recognise that we're in a pandemic, so people are online more than they've ever been. Scottish social media is quite a, a small bubble. Scottish political social media is even smaller than that. Uh, and there's a lot of personalities and things can come across as being a much bigger deal than they might be in reality to, to the wider population. Um, and I think that we're talking about committees and procedures and people giving evidence and then going back and then is Salmon going to speak? Is he not going to speak? People are really struggling to follow this. It's quite boring technical procedure. And, um, and I think at a, a bigger picture level, you have to recognise that Nicola Sturgeon's popularity is at quite incredible levels right now. It really is, considering how long uh, the SNP have been in government. I and mean, that's quite unusual. And um, and where it might be conventional, uh, if you have, were found to have um, misled Parliament or broken the mysterious code, it might be conventional in those circumstances normally to resign. But these aren't normal times. And I don't actually think that there is public appetite out there for the removal of Nicola Sturgeon from office so um, I'm not I, I, I don't oh, well. think that this is this is the big Nicola Sturgeon downfall that some of the opponents think but more broadly than that you know the idea of splits within the SNP I mean you have to also remember that after 2014 the SNP had a massive surge in membership and those members were coming from different walks of life from the left from the right from the center and they were all congregating within the SNP on on the the constitutional issue of independence um, and so you have to there's no way that the SNP could possibly have provided a political home for them all long term and um, the SNP is a single issue party can provide a home but because the SNP is in government in Scotland as well it then has to come up with policies and it has to take positions on things so you can't walk you know it's a very tight rope to walk okay. and the SNP can't yeah. continue to I, do I, that I, long term it was I, probably inevitable that something like this okay. would happen but I think the SNP was probably counting on it happening after independence rather than before it very briefly Steve. very briefly I didn't follow a lot of what I just heard but what I thought I heard was something along the lines that because a pol politician is particularly popular at the moment, that it may be OK that if they breach a ministerial code, <laughs> that they would not resign where otherwise they normally would. And I didn't have very much to say about this before, but I can't believe what I think I've just heard. Whatever happened to the truth? I, I, in that's Scotland, not I have to say, I have to no, say no, in, I, I, even I, in Scotland, I, I have to say, I think Scottish, the Scottish people expect more from the politicians than the rest of you. Angela, is that, just to and, clarify, is that what you said? Is that what you meant? No, 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 no. I'm not saying that it's okay for that to be the situation. What I'm saying is that we're in a, we're in a crisis and an un, unprecedented time where I think the public would be far more likely to overlook that because the pandemic is what is at the forefront no. of everybody. This is a time right when we need more more trust, trust in our politicians and well, more trust in our leaders. A democratic okay. institutions gonna... should be able to seek the truth. That's what this is about. It's not about the SNP, okay. Labour, the Tories. We've got, it's about the Scottish we've got Government and Parliament in. seeking the truth. I'm sorry, we've got 10 minutes left, and I very much want to get this last question in, which is from Robert Clark. Hi there. Uh, is the government doing enough to help assist the fishing and shellfish industries? 
Michael. Uh, the answer to that is no. Um, they've done quite a lot. They've made some hundred million pounds available and they've made some extra money available. But the fact is that there is quite a lot to be sorted out uh, in terms of the uh, uh, application of idiotic rules, um, both in, across the Straits into Europe and also within our own country. But the EU, is saying, the EU is saying, well, this was the deal and, you know, you've got to deal with it. Listen, if you uh, land a box of fish in Peterhead and want to get it to Northern Ireland, you used to be able to do that by the afternoon. Now, uh, it takes... Um, uh, you, you are expected, under some of the rules, you're expected to give three days' notice you know, of the plan... But these, land are the the rules that, these are rules Sorry, that the government the agreed point? to. Uh, I'm very happy to debate with you, but if I finish the point... So it takes, uh, it, you're, you're meant to give notice of three days of the landing of the fish. The fish are still in the sea at that point. It is a ridiculous rule. And so, we need, and so what Michael Gove has done, and he set up a committee under uh, a, a task force under um, David Duguid, uh, and what they need to do is to sort out these petty, stupid regulations. Otherwise, we are going to get into a very difficult situation where we have to look at the whole Northern Ireland Protocol again. And similarly, in, 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 in Holland and in France, uh, people are being told that they can't get their lorries through because they've used a red stamp rather than a blue stamp. This is the EU playing games and showing, playing. showing bad blood and bad faith, not, actually, no, for, no. Because, they, because they cannot stand the fact that Britain has left the United Kingdom, uh, the, the, the European Union, and that the United Kingdom is now an independent country. So we need to sort out these things, and the questioner is absolutely right. It's absolutely essential we do so, and that we support our fishing industry and give them the opportunity to take advantage of the, of, of the, of the benefits that come from being out of the e EU. Ian? It sounds like Michael's making a, an argument for not uh, leaving the European Union in the first place. Well, then but, we'd be being told what to do by the European Boris, Union. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, went on television on Christmas Eve in front of his Christmas tree and said there will be no non-tariff barriers with the deal that's been done with the EU. And all we're seeing is there are non-non-tariff, there's lots of non-tariff barriers. Okay. And the Scottish Fishing Federation chief executive has said herself that we must be the only coastal state in the world now that has full control over our waters, but we're fishing with one hand tied behind our backs. Mm. It's not just about sorting these things out. This is the deal that the Prime Minister put together and the deal that the Prime Minister signed. The Northern Ireland Protocol is there because we had to put a border in the Irish Sea because the border could not go on the island of Ireland. This is a consequence of leaving a trading union with one of your biggest trading partners. It's not a consequence of stupid rules, it's a consequence of what's been signed. Sorry, so North we either have to Northern find Ireland a way is through part this. Of the United Kingdom. Uh, and just finally, um, well, yes, but not in terms of the single market that it's being kept in, and the border in the well, in the customs, yeah, in, 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 the, in the customs union. So, and, and We're finally, just customs union rules. Sorry. Under customs union, and that, and that is the problem. They've had to keep them in in order to stop these non-tariff okay. barriers being put in place. It's ridiculous. And unless it's sorted, the, the, the only upside of all this at the moment, and I spoke okay. to the Scottish Fishing Federation yesterday, is because of COVID, the customers are depressed all over Europe. But when that, though that customer, customer base comes back, this will be dreadful and irresolvable unless it's done now. Stephen. So I grew up in a coastal town in Northern Ireland and I can tell you that the problems facing coastal communities and fishing communities are not new since the 1st of January. This is, I would say they've been under-supported and under-invested in for decades. And they are just... Yes, but there's a different situation now in terms of selling mm -hmm. their fish. Mm -hmm. I, I, no doubt whatsoever, but I, I, I stand by the point that the most underprivileged communities in the whole of the UK all lie along the coast. They're no longer inner cities. They're young people and, young, uh, and children in coastal communities all over the U United Kingdom. And this is another argument uh, in favour of the focus on rebuilding our economy. I have to say that there will be no support for underprivileged children and, and young people and coastal communities if we cannot restart our economy. We, have, we will have millions of people that have lost their jobs and their savings and hundreds of thousands that will have lost their homes in the years to come. And we have to start asking, when are we going to start to get people back to work and children back to school? And, and I tell you, it is the children that w live... I think, and, are, are we not a bit off the question here? Is the government doing enough to help assist the fishing and shellfish industry? It, it is genuinely, this is, we have uh, economic turmoil all over the country. And whilst we could have short-term support for the fishing communities, okay. genuinely, the, the coastal communities around the UK need long-term support and investment. Angela. You know, I think that 
the, the fishing industry is probably more than any other. It, feel, it feels very deeply that it has been sold out by the UK government when it comes to Brexit. Um, you know, the, people in the in the industry say that they were off quite often actually kind of held up by the government as, you know, look at look at this industry, look at the support that we have for Brexit. And they expected a few things within that deal that they thought were going to be absolute givens and that would imp improve uh, things for them. Now, they might not get everything that they wanted, but they thought they were going to get some things. Then the deal comes along and it turns out that they don't even get that. Um, and, and it's led to all of these other problems and the people in those industries are really kind of despondent because this deal is going to, that we're, we're talking a minimum five years before anything could change and even then it likely might not. So they, uh, it, it, I think it's appalling the level of betrayal actually that has happened in that industry and we probably don't talk about that element of that enough Jean. because it is quite important for those people in those communities. But okay. more than that, and I mean, just, I'm Michael, so sorry. I need I, to I, I need to bring Jean in, otherwise we're going to run out of time. Jean won't get enough time to say anything. Jean, off so, you go. So uh, uh, there's a number of things. First of all, this isn't about um, EU rules. This is about the deal that Boris Johnson signed. It's yes. baked into the deal because he refused to be part of the single market and the customs union, and it and it can't be changed, no matter what Michael Gove says. Secondly, Angela and Ian are both quite right. The fishing communities in the northeast have been lied to, and they have said that. That's exactly how they feel. Let's not forget the shellfish industry, which is really important in Scotland, that, that has not traded ever since uh, the, the beginning of the year, not traded at all uh, because of everything they have to go through. And today in the Scottish Parliament, the major exporters from Scotland in our food and drink said that Brexit was a disaster that it was increasing their costs, making trade really difficult. And for some of our young entrepreneurial companies that don't want to send a whole lorry load, but they want to send part of a lorry load, it, it's not financially viable for them to do that because of all the bureaucracy that comes as a consequence of the deal Boris Johnson signed. There's no way around it. You can't spin it any other way. It's because of the deal that was signed the fact that we're outside of a major trading partner is going to wreak havoc on our economy. And it's, you know, it's huge irony, Michael, that you are proud that the UK is now an independent country, but you want to deny the people of Scotland the chance to decide whether or not they want to do, be do you think an it's independent reasonable? country. Do you think it's reasonable for a man taking a digger from the mainland uh, of Britain to Northern Ireland should be told he's got to wash the digger before it can get into Northern Ireland? because it's got British soil on it. Do you think that's part of the deal? That, that, is the part, deal. That, that is was the that, deal that, that your Prime Minister signed. That is part of petty, fogging bureaucracy. And if it, part of and the if deal it, he signed. Well, if it, well, then the deal needs to be undone. But this is the deal that would determine the relationship between an independent Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, no, the one that Jean doesn't would, like. No, an independent <laughs> Scotland would... An independent Scotland would have the opportunity to be packed into that European Union, that large trading partner okay. that we wanted to stay with and had to turn our back on because we're part of we the We are United out of time. We could then discuss what the border might look like with England, and I know that's what you want to do, but I'm afraid we are out of time. So, our hour is up. Um, thank you very much to the panel for coming along this evening. Anja, thank you very much for joining us down the line, and thank you to the audience in the North East. I could see a couple of you waving frantically at the end there. I couldn't get you in. We were out of time, so apologies for that. And to you at home, thank you very much for watching from Question Time. Bye-bye.